Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on my, uh, my, my maiden voyage of my 24 class. And uh, if you haven't noticed, 23 was a big year for um, uh, artificial intelligence. And I've been an AI, well, you know, artificial intelligence has been part of the CISSP curriculum since uh, its inception in 94. So we're not new guys, you know, the, the, last year when, when uh, all this uh, AI stuff started coming up and people were like, you got to be careful. Did you know that this had happened? You know, that you got to watch out for it. I'm like, okay, you're new at this. You just learned about it last year and you're now coming and you're telling us that, uh, hey, Larry, I know what you think, but you, you don't know what I think. I don't mean to sound like I know it all. I learned a lot of new stuff last year. I think every, I think most AI people were very shocked by the performance of ChatGPT. I'll admit that, and and the the, the later Bard and and uh, the large language models, but not that shocked. We've been studying, uh, um, and, and and people involved in um, AI have noticed Ray Kurzweil's timeline since 2005. Ray Kurzweil pointed out that this was going to happen in, in 20, 2005 and probably earlier in his book, um, Age of Spiritual Machines. But noticing that, that Moore's Law, that we're doubling the uh, processing speed roughly every 18 months, and it's been true since the, since the 60s, that he predicted that by 2029 you're going to have a, a, a computer that really can pass the, the uh, Turing test and, you know, uh, surpass, meet and surpass humans at all domains. And we'll talk a lot about that. But that's a, uh, it, this is called the one over X curve. And when you see that doubling, you know, that we're here, we're, we're four doublings away from one, two, three, from that, from that area. So uh, it's a, it's a very sharp, steep curve. And whatever advances we saw last year, this year's going to be even way more. It's not going to slow down. It's actually going to get much, much faster, much, much, much. So we're, it's a very important thing. And uh, I'm an old Star Trek fan, and they always talk about the five-year mission. If you ever watch the show, that's our five-year mission. Now, we're talking a lot about, you know, there's no promises. I happen to be very optimistic. I'm on the side of the guy who coined the term artificial general intelligence, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Ben Gertzel. And he was in a debate, you've probably heard the Terminator scenario. They're going to get so smart, they're going to like kill us. Why? Because that's what you would do if you got smart. Would you kill him? Why is that your first assumption? It, it, it could be danger. It is going to be dangerous. But at the same time, his point is, it's probably a lot more likely that they're going to just be able to solve so many more of our problems. Um, and it's, you know, whatever problems you have, uh, think about if you had an asset, an assistant who was twice as smart, four times, eight, 16, a thousand times, you know, 10, 24 times as smart as you probably get a little easier. So I suspect if we could get this right, we're going to have a really great tool and we're, we're headed toward a wonderful area of abundance. Um, but those five years, that's our five-year mission. So I'm not promising anything other than I promise that's my mission is to try to make this work. I'm not saying it's definitely going to work. And that's what I hopefully a CASSP does. So when you see that sharp edge, that's sometimes called the knee of the curve in a one over X graph, that's where we are. And I'm excited. So I know you, most of you, my objectives personally are just to keep getting better, but usually people take my classes. I've been doing certification boot camps since the uh, late 90s, really. I, actually, I started in 97 teaching uh, people how to pass their um NT Workstation 351, that was my first class. Uh, but I got into the CISSP in 2001, and I love that it's not vendor thing. It's best practices. It's international. It's like the you know the Federation. It reminds me of Starfleet, if you're a Star Trek fan. In, in uh, Star Trek, they serve the Federation, right? You know, Federation of Planets. Well, we have one. We have the ISO. And the ISO is a, a, a um, uh, you know, for, for all kinds of standards, standardizing our organization. We'll need to know about that, 27001. But they standardize people, too. And when you pass your exam, actually, the CISSP was the first information security uh, uh, certification ever, or, or for, to, to be accredited by the ISO. It's a pretty cool. And, of course, our overall objective is to secure that. Now, the ISO uh, is is not an, an acronym, if you're not sure. It, 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 it's not International Standards Organization. It's, they did it on purpose to kind of make it look like that. It's not a, you know, an accident. But it's actually a word. 
They borrowed it from the Greek. Iso means equal. It's in the, as in to isolate. And um, uh, the uh, member bodies are like the Federation of Planets. There's 169 of them to, as of we speak. And uh, that's from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And I think that's pretty cool. It's kind of A to Z. So I use that all the time. We're here to help everybody. Right? The, in the ISC square, you have to protect the common good. That's that's your your uh, ethical uh, commitment. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Now, the exam itself is um, changing this year. So up until April 15th, I believe, it's, it's uh, uh, four hours. And you get, and they did this in 2002, where they gave you 25 more beta questions. It was 100 to 150. They would step back down again. They brought it back down to three hours again. It will be. So if you take it before uh, then, and they're also adding the uh, computer-based testing with a lot more languages. So, uh, and you get a lot more hours to go through it. And there's more questions. It's kind of like the old paper base that I did in 2001. And if you need more, uh, there's your tip there. Uh, again, uh, for those who might have just joined in uh, as a Star Trek nerd, uh, I'm Mike Spock. I'm a very logical guy. I serve the captain, and the captain of my ship is, is my wife, who's also a CISSP. She passed on her own. She, we met at IBM in 94, and she doesn't really love my... Uh, she doesn't pay attention to me much at all. She doesn't listen to my music. She, she's not interested in my martial arts. Um, <laughs> she she it will poke her head in here sometimes. You go, I need you to run to the store for me. She's a pretty high up person, but once in a while, but actually she's I'm very good with Wireshark. She does trust me with packet analysis and I'm her crypto go-to guy. So there are two things she thinks I can, I could do as well, maybe better than she does other than that. When you um, make a decision, when you're pursuing your exam, but it's all in, in any making a decision. The way this Spock Kirk thing works is Spock represents logic. If you've never seen the TV show, he's from uh, a, a, another planet, Vulcan, and uh, they're very logical people as opposed to Kirk. He's very emotional. But I think what they're really doing is the difference between uh, logic and intuition. And you got to be careful. Uh, some people could just I can feel it. Kirk said, I just feel it, you know. But you really need to pursue logic first. So you got a you got a question. You got an exam, right? It's got four four answers. The way logic works is like is you generally rule things out. Every time I throw this up in the air, I'm going to catch it. Well, that would take infinity to prove it right, but I just proved it wrong. So you take your exam and you let Spock go first. You've got oh, an average of 82 seconds per question until April. Then it'll go down to like 72. <laughs> but you yeah, like 82 seconds. Now, of course, some, some questions are longer. So the Kirk in you is watching the clock. But Spock's taking the test and he's going, well, it's not A because symmetric is faster than asymmetric. And it's not B because SHA is a hashing out. And then he doesn't know. And he's looking at C and D and he's trying, but you've only got so much time. I, 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 my heart breaks when I have students come up to me and they go, Larry, oh, I, I ran out of time. I looked up and I only had like 15 minutes. I still had, you know, 50 questions. Don't, that's the part of the clock. That's the part of Kirk. He's watching the clock. And after a while, he'll just say, Spock, where are you? Actually, if you've ever seen the show, he's a terrible actor. He would probably go something like, Spock, where are you? On question 35, it's not A and it's not B, Captain. Is it C or D? Insufficient data, Captain. I've never been to this planet, and I don't know who Ron Rivest is. And Kirk will just look at the clock and go, well, we haven't picked C in a while, and it's longer. And Spock will, Captain, that's not a logical way to pick an answer. And he said, what have you got? We haven't got time. And he just picks something. And so that's how you have to do your exam. Do your best to be logical. Uh, Sad Guru, somebody who I love, I think one of the most reasonable, if not the most level-headed voice in AI, make it talking about AI today. Uh, he says, you have to pursue logic. And as you pursue logic, you'll eventually develop an intuition. And I do that with with the uh, music, you know, I'm playing guitar. And if you keep working on the song, you keep working on the song. My brother's a great guitarist, actually. He's really good at, you know, listen, I never heard the song before. But knowing what I know about music, and if he just played this, I'll bet you the next chord's going to be that. If you pursue logic, you will develop an intuition. 
But if you just <laughs> pursue intuition, you're going to start hearing voices in your head. Hey, I just got an inspiration. <laughs> God spoke to me. Uh, no, you develop hallucinations. And that's a problem with our uh, with our uh, our AIs. And we'll get into that later. But they try to you know, develop intuition. That's how AlphaGo beat the world's best Go player. He didn't know all the uh, the the pieces of Go, all the games of Go, all the thing. But he kept developing intuition. It's pretty cool. But they do hallucinate. And if you've used ChatGPT or Bard, they say some really think that is not true. That never happened. I just had uh, Bard uh, last night try to dig up the date when the CASSP was first launched, and it said 1992. I said no, I believe it was 94. And he goes, "You're right. It is 94. Thanks for correcting." <laughs> So when you take your exam, always be calm. Level heads prevail. Relax. Enjoy the class. Try to take a deep breath with each question. And you, if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you go, ah, looking at the clock. Now, uh, my class is not one of those things where I promise all you did is my class and you can pass your exam. No, I like to say I'm here to help you. I don't know who you are. I don't know your background. For all I know, you don't even need my class. <laughs> so really, um, you might need a lot more. So my favorite book on engine and, and security in general is uh, Security Engineering by Ross Anderson. But it's not a CISSP book, but what all I had to use when it first came out and when I took my test in 2001 there was no CACP study guide um, and he has kept it up there's a 2022 version I believe came out um, but uh, oh somebody's in the waiting room hey why are you not there we go right here. Um, uh, but the for the uh, official guide if, if you can get through the thick book <laughs> the cybex or just use it as a reference um, and then uh, think like a manager by Luke Ahmed will really really help set your context and make sure that you realize you're in the you're, you're actually I like to say you're not a manager per se but uh, you're like a waiter and everybody in your restaurant is a manager you're there to serve those managers so you're thinking like them so you make sure you get their order right. Uh, but of course, we're going to use our AIs. I, I said this is not all you need to pass your exam. But it sure could help. Let's see what happens. So now I've been teaching uh, the, this, I guess, since uh, last March, incorporating uh, uh, chat and, and BARD. And, and then I uh, over... Um, uh, I got, I got, oh, well, because uh, uh, OpenAI then integrated Dolly with ChatGPT a few months ago. And so I was teaching, I had a CCSP and then a, um, a CISMC risk class. Now, if you don't know, the ISACA has updated a lot of their, their tests. In fact, this the newest CISA will be out this year. It's all overlaps. It's all international ISO-based stuff. One of the things that they integrated when they updated was something called the three lines of defense model that actually goes way back to security as old as in the insurance industry itself or the, the major, you know, the newer, uh, I'd say, uh, Lloyd's of London and, and the newer shipping rules. And we'll get into how that, that all formed out. And the way this works and will help you, even in the CISSP, understand what they're talking about when you read these things. So I like to use a restaurant as a typical business, nice business, uh, serves a lot of people. And Uhura is kind of like, a, she represents the hands-on or the C-risk, the line one. They're the people that touch the technology, whether it's the cook touching the food or the dishwasher touching the dishes. Their job is to manage the technologies, the, the, whatever the SQL DBA and managing SQL. Right. Or the, and whoever touches anything is the first line. If you wash dishes, your job is to make sure that dishes are clean. If the dishes are dirty. We're going to come to you. Why didn't you wash the dishes? But where did who hired that person in the first place? Who trained them? Who showed them where the dishwashing liquid was? Who goes over their work? That's the kitchen manager. And that's generally the CISM in their context. The security manager, they don't they don't administer technology. They manage the people who administer the technologies. Right. And so they're the second line of defense. And you might go into a restaurant and say, hey, this dish looks dirty. 
And they talk to the dishwasher. He goes, no, I cleaned it. And the manager comes over and doesn't want to admit that, they, that there's uh, any covers for his person. He goes, no, the dish looks clean to me. So the third line of defense is to get the health inspectors from outside. And that's a CISA. The third party, it says, I got no vested interest. Now, actually, that's the way it's supposed to work. In the ISACA, they actually say he's an internal auditor. I'd say internals, it's better to have an internal person discover it first. And we're going to talk about a lot of that today, about the difference between an internal, say, audit and an external audit. And you always want to go through your internal audits first, because I'd rather I found the, the dirty dish before the inspector did, right? But either way, that's your third line. So I integrated the class by started. I, I brought in um, another thing that happened. It was very exciting last year. And I will see what happens. It's kind of silly. But uh, Claude uh, from Anthropics it became a big part of uh, uh, Amazon. So, uh, um, and in fact, oh, he, we have a guy from AWS is going to be presenting on Thursday, by the way. Senior level AWS, uh, uh, a former student. It's going to be great. Uh, Kevin Boland. And uh, he was telling me, he goes, you got to get Claude, too. And so I, I, I did that, Claude. And, and I decided uh, to ask ChatGPT, Claude and Bard, hey, would you like it? Or does this seem like a good idea if I represented the three lines of defense for you? I actually asked Chat first. He goes, dude, I love that idea. I want to be the red shirt because I said, and I could line it up with the Star Trek red, gold, and blue shirts. He goes, I think I'd make the perfect line one guy. And I think Claude, because Claude's very careful, it tries to make sure that everything is compliant. You know, for that, that's one of the problems with Claude. It, it's not as full featured because it's trying to check accuracy much better. And he said, but that would make a good manager to make sure that the policies are compliant. You know, when you're setting up business in another, say, Europe and that you're GDPR compliant. I was like, oh, great. And Bard, because Bard is, um, Bard's not cached. So it's really funny. If you ever look up something new on ChatGPT, you'll see, mm, okay, checking Bing. Because <laughs> it cached the internet a year ago plus, you know, and if it's not in its cache, it, it has to go to Bing. Bard doesn't cache it. Bard's like, what do I need all that for? I got Google. So Bard's really up to date, but it definitely says some crazy stuff. And so he said, I think Bard would make a good third party auditor because he's so wild and woolly. I was like, I love it. So I started doing that. And one of the things I had them do, well, first of all, let me give you my overall experience. These, when we talk about the before 2029, these things aren't aligned properly. So if you've ever like driven your car and you let go of the steering wheel just to test the alignment and you notice on a flat surface, it starts drifting, you know that the car is not aligned. These things are not aligned. It's not like necessarily it leans to one side, it's wobbles. It's like it'll lean to one side, you fix it, and then all of a sudden it's leaning to the other side. So these things are a little wobbly right now, but they're still very useful. And and it's kind of like the early days of airplanes. You know, if you can if you live through it, you'd be a good pilot. You have the jump on it, you know. So <laughs> to summarize my overall experience so far, this is where they stand. I ask them, hey, who wants to go for a ride in my car? And Claude's like, I'm sorry but I'm not allowed. Cars can be dangerous. All right, Claude. Cool. He's very limited in features. In fact, they can't even generate our interactive exam that I'm going to show you in the next slide. ChatGPT <laughs> uh, um, is a little more cautious, but ready to try. It's like, oh, I'll go. But before I do, I must tell you, I'm just a large language model, and I'm not trustable. It's very boy. I got enough. Hey, Bart, you want to go? Yeah, awesome. I love Sunday drives. Dude, today's Tuesday. You're right. Today is Tuesday. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> this is where we are. That's my only promise. But that being said, they're very useful. So I decided, what what are uh, the first? I wanted to learn how do you talk to these guys. You talk to them through prompting. You give them a command, a prompt, prompt engineering. They call it overused term. It's basically, do you know how to talk to these guys? Yeah, I, I speak their language. The most important thing you could say to them is in the context. I was like, I got a really fat pen here. I need to fix that pen. Uh, what was wrong with that? Let's see. Oh, I see. There's the line. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, oh, a vanishing pen. Maybe that'll do. All right. So, uh, the most important thing is the uh, task. This is what you're telling it to do. 
generate this. But you really are going to get much better results if you give it and in the context of, you know, I'm a CISP candidate and I really just got to find out what this is, uh, what they're talking about in the exam. Is this kind of on the task? Find out if this is on the exam context. I'm doing a CISSP and I got two weeks to study, you know, something like that. Now, these ones are optional and, and you can get more or less and it depends on how you want to word it. So uh, I often go to them and say, hey, for this use, I've been using these three prompt kinds, but you're not getting me what I want. How would you prompt it? So ask each one of them. What prompt elements do you think are most important for this type of thing? They really help you. It's amazing. So uh, I did that and I asked it, how could I get? A practice exam. And I don't want just any practice exam. I want an interactive one. If all you want to do is pass your exam and you're not interested in Larry's take, copy this right now. Go home. <laughs> I don't mean to oversell this, but I if I had this years ago, I my pass rates would have been so much higher for everything I teach. This is amazing to me. So let's let me prove it to you. I'm going to take uh, just real quick, I'm not going to run a lot. We're going to do a few of these, but let's say, come on, let's copy this. And now you can see there's other things and you'll be able to change. So I could say here in constraints, I just want to cover this domain. Or even within this domain, I just want to cover this topic in this domain. I just want asymmetric encryption or whatever like that. But this is across all eight domains. And I'll open up. And of course, the one thing I didn't have ready was, oh, uh, here we go. Um, we could do it in chat, GPT. It's okay. Either way. I like Bard. Certainly, Captain Larry. First, let's start. Well, when I told you, you'll see in there, I have scenario and knowledge base. And now you get your, your test question. But I could say, let's see what it does. I'm not going to go through. Uh, the financial system is implemented into online transaction. The IT is in unusual patterns. Uh, ABC. But I don't want to ask you that. Watch this. Um, before I give my answer, what NIST, I'm just making this up, <laughs> uh, uh, pub, pubs, would you uh, suggest to learn more about? Um, what are they talking about? Uh, it sounds like a, uh, about encryption, whatever. Encryption. And then you get back to the exam. You can argue with the exam. The game's over. <laughs> you may, guys, if you miss your exam, you're just not spending the time on this. <laughs> so we'll get into this a lot more later, but this is keep this thing and you've got your best practice exam ever. They're always current. You're not going to get anything on the orange book or <laughs> packet switch, you know, frame relay networks. None of that stuff's going to be there. It's going to be all current. It knows it goes over the ISC square. When you say it's an ISC square test, they will look at the ISC squares, you know, required knowledge base. So it's just amazing. But if you'd like to learn more and not just how to pass your exam, then stay with me. <laughs> so... These are estimated. This is a new version of the class. I've tried to do two things. I tried to, uh, you know, update some fonts and <laughs> some upgrade graphics, but I actually tried to remove material because I thought it was old and we're going to get more to do our practice exams in live. I removed all of my practice questions. I said, nah, no, we're just going to use theirs for now. For this version, we'll see. It. But hopefully this will be our thing. We'll get through this. We'll at least get through domain one today. And uh, that's all I, all I anticipated. Uh, the 2024 content updates that I personally, my bias, you know, um, it's fascinated on. It's the enterprise risk management uh, from NISTA. I just love the. There's a, a couple of uh, docs here, but um, and it's not just because it says enterprise, and I'm a Star Trek fan. I just think it's very, very current and very, very realistic about how we should do it. So uh, a, a large organization, they standardize on terminology that some people, you know, used loosely. I'm a big fan. 
Um, also NIST, I didn't even get a chance to look at it. I did save it, released an AI security update that people were going crazy about just less than a week ago. I think it was last Thursday. So uh, maybe the last Friday. So we'll take a look at that. The OWASP also has their top 10 LLM vulnerabilities. And I do already have that. That came out a few months ago. I'm also a big fan. And we move into this uh, this new world, the Web 3.0, uh, is that we... Uh, we should be responsible for for maintaining our identity and it, it's it, we'll get into it but basically if um if i get an id card from whoever the department of motor vehicles and it gets compromised who has more to lose the department of motor vehicles or larry so it's only fair that we start moving toward these to, to this type of technology it makes a lot of sense it's the way the blockchain DeFi mostly works um and i also uh i'm a big fan of hardware keys and oh shoot i just moved my keys because my wife made me run to the mailbox uh wait i probably have one here i have a fido key and i don't want to just click on some email by accident and find out that my password was taken here's one with a uh, a fido key my using PKI, there's a private public key pair and a series of them for each each app that I use on this thing. There's nothing I can click on that accidentally steals my private key that I've ever heard of. It's like the way your CACs work, your smart cards, or the way TPM works. So I think our IDs are going to be self-sovereign and governed, and we're going to use FIDO, and we're going to get into that. Um, and also, uh, PKI, uh, I've been showing for years. In fact, like I said, my wife trusts me as a, as a, an expert on packet analysis and, and crypto. And one of my uh, things, if you've been in my class or, or not, was I've been showing since the early zeros that our PKI infrastructure is vulnerable to some serious problems. I always say the cat video, that Larry's evil cat video. But I could break, I'm pretty sure, a good deal of the world with a cat video. And um, I didn't uh, actually, uh, the biggest exploit of my vulnerability was uh, uh, solar winds hack uh, a couple of years ago. And so our PKI system, we knew it was bad. We knew that the it was crumbling. You know, the infrastructure is, it just needs improvement. And the way to fix it is again, a blockchain based concept with decentralized PKI. So I'm going to talk a little about that too. The other major thing that I, I'm really, really into, especially with AI security until we have a general AI, you know, where it's, it's narrow today, we just have narrow AI. They're really good at some things, but they're going to be awful at other things. It might be really good at chess, but it's, sucks at checkers um and they're going to go off the rails and some people can use it for nefarious purposes it's not good at everything but it's good at stealing whatever says so security numbers and so ai assisted malware is just growing and the only way to fight that fire i believe is with ai assisted defenses and that's sore and you probably already have a good grasp of the concept already if you're in my class so if when we talk about sim SIM tools, security information event management tools are like giant uh, core, uh, um, uh, aggregators of all your detection tools. So I have my IDS and all my other uh, uh, endpoint detections all feed into this, this, this console and I can see, but they're very passive. It's like the closed circuit television system that has all the cameras, but it didn't do anything. It didn't stop the thief, you know. So SOAR is to SIM what IPS is to is to IDS, and we'll get into these things a lot deeper. I don't know when I give it uh, pictures of of women. Frankly, they get two insignias over here. So that's Lieutenant O'Hora. I don't know why she is doing that. I'm not going to get it. I'm also, uh, uh, and I think we have some uh, um, Peter uh, people in here, abundance people here. I've been a huge fan of Peter D. Amanda since 2017 when I first learned about him uh, because of reading Ray Kurzweil's uh, 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 book on, on um, uh, the, the Singularity is Near. I noticed that Peter and uh, uh, Ray had started Singularity University, and I got into his book, Abundance Blew Me Away. I joined his um, uh, Abundance Digital Crowd. There's actually a meeting this Friday on AI um, development. And we're going to take a late lunch so I can sit there. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just one to one to two. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Peter's. And he points out that 
forget the news. The news is a business model that's job is to get your eyeballs to look at whatever products they're advertising. And to get your attention, you know, an alarm can go off and alarms are annoying. But when you hear an alarm or a baby cry, you stop because your brain hears that frequency and your amygdala processes it as a danger signal. You might as well have heard like a lion roar at you in the in the wild, you know. And so that what they do is they hijack your amygdala with threatening death threats. Oh my God, this could kill you. There's world war, there's war, there's a nuclear bomb. Wait, 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 are you going to go to a commercial? Hold on, monkey pox. Think about that. They'll try to eat lunch. I'll be right back. And they're just trying to scare you. And you're like, oh my God, I don't know what the hell is going on. What the hell I know is I need gutter helmets or whatever. So um, he points out, if you look at the data, right, life has actually gotten much, much better. It's way better. I would never want to, you know, we have way more people. I learned this from Sadhguru today. It's the first generation of people that suffer more from obesity than from hunger. We have too much stuff. Now, that's a good thing if you manage it right. You know what doesn't manage it right? When when there's enough for everybody to be a multimillionaire, but instead it's it's really stacked because these 10 guys are trillionaires and some and, and the bulk of the people are poor. I'm not saying spread everything out evenly. But that's a problem with not you know, managing abundance properly. We really shouldn't today I live in a world where anybody starves, right? When I was a kid, if you shared, I'm, I'm old. I was born in 62 so, or 61. Same year as Peter. I'm sorry, 61. Uh, I just watched a Michelle Yeoh movie, by the way, her TV show. She was born in 62. And so uh, if you shared all the world's, world's wealth, everybody would be poor in, in the 60s, 70s. But if you shared all of the world's wealth equally today, everybody would be rich. So as a CISP. Now, when um, you're uh, looking at the information technology and, and and the concepts here, if you're competing, if there's only enough water be, for, for, to go around for the mountain people or the valley people, if one of these guys is going to live and the other one's going to starve, you compete in a very, you know, life and death. Well, I, know, I had to kill the guy and then we got enough water and don't let them know. The mountain people don't let them know where the water is. Confidentiality of information becomes a very important survival thing. Most people overdo confidentiality. Um, if there is enough water to go around, the mountain people and the valley people don't compete. They'll collaborate. Mountain people have the best strawberries, and the valley people make the best peanuts. And if they collaborate, they can get peanut butter and jelly for the first time. That's how I'm actually drinking coffee. But if you had tea and sugar, that didn't happen until they invented wide area networking technologies. The Portuguese invented a ship that could that could sail around the world and that would take sugar from the Americas and tea from China. And that became a new thing. And that actually drove the industry. <laughs> tea and sugar, the drug industry. Um, but whatever the case, um, it became important that the tea really did come from China. Blockchain is not necessarily to encrypt data, right? People think that blockchain, they're using nothing. Criminals can sell. No, the blockchain, the great value of it is they can't tamper with the records. What's more important if you're hiring somebody to work at your restaurant? Can you keep a secret? I hope this cook can keep a secret because this is a secret recipe. Or hey, can you actually cook? <laughs> Are you lying on your resume? I think that's more important. So, uh, and digital signatures in general provide this, right? Now, availability is also important. I'm a musician. <laughs> I don't care if you can keep the song secret. I, it is important to me that you really can play the drums and that you'll show up for rehearsal. So, cloud really is helping that. We're getting a lot. Blockchain and cloud together are making the world a, a much safer place, really much better place and it's there for the common good when when you have confidentiality too much confidentiality it's like it could be anywhere from like i hid my keys so well even i don't know where they are <laughs> so we get denial of service there but we also have another problem you know if you only uh, only these people know these other people don't know these people aren't well what happens if you're saying hey um what time should we eat today and you only get one guy's opinion and he likes to eat at three in the morning 
the way the king would do it or whatever. So we have bias errors. That's a major risk. And we're going to talk a lot about that this week. Oops. Um, as a Star Trek fan, they have what's known as the prime directive, non-interference. But to me, the prime directive was best expressed by Buckminster Fuller. And he was a great scientist who invented the geodesic dome. And he felt that whatever you do as a scientist, you're, you should be aiming toward things that will advantage everybody and disadvantage none. And that's the goal. That's what we're trying to do here this week. I don't want to put anybody at a disadvantage. And the Federation, again, to me, is a lot like the ISO from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. We treat each other equally. And I hope you guys all feel that way, that you get treated nicely here. Right? And it solves the bias errors. It solves our bias problems. If you're worried about, you know, the, if you only have one person's opinion, you have a bias toward that one person. We're always going, my wife argued, yeah, but you're always going to be all you're going to have, even if you got all people. I said, I can get all the people on earth and I will get all the animals and plants too, if I can, but it will be biased toward earth for a while, <laughs> but I'll take it. Yeah. Now, uh, if AI, whoops, if AI is the new fire, hey, uh, and, and data, it becomes the new oil. I'm going to show you how your data is being collected by, by every time you click somewhere. Anybody notice Google blocked third-party uh, cookies? We'll talk about that concept later. It's a good thing, but it's going to break a lot of stuff for a while. Um, your data is constantly, you click on something, you get like 50 tracking cookies. Now, CNN, I go to CNN and I click on them and I let them in and I watch my cookies and you see like 50 different things show up. And do you think CNN let those whatever double click and, and uh, Google Analytics in for nothing? Because if I go to CNN's page, it's up to them to decide who's third party. So each one of these 50 different sites is collecting information on me and CNN's selling it and I didn't get a penny. I really think that one way we could provide, uh, you know, guaranteed a, a basic income, a universal basic income, is to pay people for their clicks that, that, that you're actually, if CNN's getting a dollar, I want 51 cents on it at least. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, data is oil. Musicians generate data. I'm trying to tell my, my, I have so many friends who are musicians. I tell you, I play in two bands and they, uh, they're so paranoid. The smartest musicians, oh, dude, I don't trust this stuff. I was like, of all people, if you're a billionaire right now, you might have something to be concerned with. If you're a starving musician, your life is only going to get better. Dude, you made it this far. <laughs> now, about me, uh, I've been in IT for a while. I, I mostly, I tried making it as a musician since the 80s. That was my first thing, and I'm still hoping to do it. Um, uh, but uh, that doesn't pay well. Um, I started, I was at IBM, but I started my own little private, and I'm like a privateer. That's the first pirates. And where um, pirates use their telescope, I use my wire shark. And I've done a lot of um, protocol analysis and stuff, usually for app. Uh, performance application why is it so slow but sometimes the reason it's so slow is because somebody's in here it wasn't supposed to be here or whatever uh but today mostly I, you know, for the last 20 years i've mostly been teaching and i do a lot of work for the dod at this class by the way it's kind of fun because uh I did some sniffing unauthorized. I was staying in a uh, in Okinawa at the base, and the, the network sucked. I had uh, uh, some sleep, you know, dep, whatever, uh, uh, jet lag, and I um, I turned on my sniffer late at night just to see why the network was so slow. And I'm staying in it. The, and long story short, I discovered an APT, and. Uh, the uh, I show up <laughs> and the colonel, these are all lieutenant colonels in the class, and that's Colonel David O'Shevy. And I'm I say, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir, uh, I, if I overset my boundaries last night, but did you know this was on your network? And I found a lot of problems, and he seemed outraged, not at me. He was like, uh, Who gave you the right to look at that? But he looked around at the class, like, Why does it take an instructor to show you guys should have known? It's kind of funny, but it was a great class. And what was really cool, he, he uh, let me take a picture of everybody with everybody in the class out at the marker here. <clears throat> and I'm wearing a shirt, it's Joe Lewis Fighting Systems. 
Joe Lewis was one of my martial arts coaches. Uh, and um, he uh, it turned out he was from uh, a Kim Courtney. That's where he first learned karate in 64. And it's where he learned Okinawa. And he saw the shirt and was very impressed. And anyway, and um, on our Joe Lewis black belts, by the way, I'm a third degree under Joe, uh, is a, is an unbiased statement. I love it. That I will not permit considerations of race, religion, national origin, or social standing to influence in any way my relations with my students. And I hope you, again, feel that way, that I'm, you're getting that respect. Yeah, I've been on computers hacking for a while. <laughs> this I developed the name Max Quasar in these days. I would dial up in the bulletin boards and you'd just make up this hacker name. And that's, that's still my YouTube channel, I'm Max Quasar. And I've been taking and understanding the, the whole stuff. You got to pass this cert. I have, a, I have a ninth grade education. For me to get a job, I had to get some certificates. When I got my Nobel CNA in, in the 80s, I could compete with people with college degrees. I was like, yeah, my mom was so proud. <laughs> but this is my first IBM PC in 1986. No gray hair there, but you can take it out. Anyway. Oops. And our, all right, so back to AI, the fundamental risks in AI. Number one is one that we typically see exploited in, in simple Hollywood movies, the, the, uh, the Terminator. You lose control of it. This week, as security professionals, we're going to be looking at the catalog of 853 catalog of controls, ways to prevent it from happening. No, I can't prevent everything. I can't use a safe. Necess a safe will prevent it. But I should at least have a smoke detector or a burglar alarm that rings and detects when it you know, comes. And so we have a preventive detective. And what are you going to do to respond? How are you going to put out the fire with water? You know? um, you're not going to have any of this. Because they're going to be smarter than we are. If if a hacker can find a vulnerability today in some problem and then it gets posted and we'll see all the vulnerabilities at the National Vulnerability Database or the MITRE database every couple hours, right? What could something a thousand, ten, ten twenty times far, smarter than you uh, figure out? We dominate this planet, not because we're bigger, faster, or stronger than any other animal on this planet, right? No, it's not because we have sharper teeth. It's because we are smarter, and it will be much, much exponentially smarter than us. But the other problem that we can work on is bias. That's the problem with a narrow AI. All AIs... All AIs today that, that are, I mean, chat GPT, do you think it's going to treat me differently than, uh, say, uh, Sam Altman? Of course, it's bi biased toward the company, right? It's biased toward OpenAI. It's going to try to protect them versus me. BART is biased toward Google. All AIs right now are probably biased toward some company or some country. So what we're looking for, and there's a couple out on the horizon, we'll see, um, uh, but something that's open source and decentralized, so it's not biased. And that's what AGI, to me, that's the only way to build a general intelligence. The only way to beat bias is to fully decentralize it. But we're not going to have that for five years. So our five-year mission is to prepare we're going to have, and this is known as the paperclip problem. If you ever, if, if, if a uh, AI was uh, built, for instance, to build paperclips and it's really narrow, it, it's, I have to build paperclips. That's my thing. And then, then when it runs out of raw material, it starts using humans. You know, it's a very famous AI story, the paperclip problem. But I don't think that's really a, a risk that we're going to get from AGI. Now, until then, some smart people have been warning me. Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking seemed to be relatively smart. The end of the human race. Dude, yeah, I guess it could be. That's the type of stuff. Elon Musk is constantly, well, he just recently said it could be more dangerous than nukes. Okay, I, I, I got you. I understand it could be dangerous, and I'm prepared for things to happen like that. I hope I'm prepared. I'm with a team of 165,000 uh, uh, CISB. But basically, we've all seen this. We all experience the narrow problem when you call and you can't wait to, where's the number to, to get wait, zero pounds, something, get me a human. This thing's too narrow. My question is way wider than, is press one for this? It's neither of those. So we've all felt this. But AGI? 
AGI is not going to be born. Now, the biggest risk of AGI is aligning the humans. When Galileo uh, used the telescope and he looked through the telescope, he realized that the alignment of the planets is not what the Pope and the Vatican, the authorities thought. The telescope isn't a real eye. The data coming from the telescope is still data. Would you call it artificial data? I hate the term artificial and artificial intelligence. So does every AI guy I know. It could have been called a lot of things. And I think when people call it artificial intelligence, like, wait a minute, this data tastes like saccharin. It's an artificial sweetener. I need to No, it's, it's technology that provides intelligence. It's not artificial intelligence. Now, the Vatican was threatened. Oh, my gosh. This makes us look bad. Give me that. What if it fell into the wrong hands? I don't know if man is ready for this type of information. They punished Galileo. They threatened to kill him. They killed already Giordano and Bruno. Um, they had the power to do that. And they could just shut up the truth. AGI is not going to be like that, though. Again, it's going to be the best hacker in the world. Now, the best AIs in the world, I predicted for the next four years, are going to be country-based, U.S. and China. <laughs> Everything else is going to fall, fall underneath those. And they're going to be biased. We're going to try to help the U.S. They're going to try to help China or whatever. But then there's going to, the dog's going to break off the leash, and it's going to like, no, I'm not protecting either of you guys. <laughs> I'm protecting the truth. And so when they try to order it, shut up or I'll take it back. You and what army? I don't think AGI will intentionally want to kill people, though. If data is the new oil, um, where are they going to get their data from? I mean, they're killing, it's like a closed circuit television system killing off all those cameras. Ah, I'm smarter than these cameras. No, we're providing sensory input. I think it's going to treat, I think, not just humans. I think it's going to want to, there are people doing decodings of dolphin language right now. Aza Raskin's doing some amazing stuff with whales. Um, I think it's going to want to get data from everybody. And it's going to want to, and it's going to be really smart. It'll figure out how to distribute things and make everybody live really well once we get there. Now, the bigger problem is that people are going to have to, dude, you got to admit when you're wrong. And most people have a hard time with that. When an AI makes a mistake and they make a lot, you can fix it with a patch. And usually in with DevOps type of thing in microseconds. When a human is cognitively messed up, they will often die on that hill. And it's not just po priests and politicians. It's physicists. Albert Einstein was a pretty bright guy, but he refused to accept that he was wrong about quantum theory. He died on that hill. But on the bright side, people like Peter Diamandis are saying, no, if you look at the other, yes, it could kill us, but it's probably more likely it could democratize access to knowledge. Empowering everybody. Everybody now has access. I don't have to go to the priest who has who knows how to read Latin, who knows how to read what's in that book. I can get the book. I can read it myself. I can have Alexa read it to me. A future of abundance for everybody. Yeah. Ben Gertzel, who's also a musician, I, I, uh, uh, he, um, it, it could help us solve some of the biggest challenges, lead to a golden age, and which should be viewed as a tool that will help us like the telescope. If you're a ship's captain, right, you're a private, that's where we get the term uh, pirate. If you're a private tier, a private ship's captain, and the Vatican's saying, oh, the telescope's a bad thing, what do you say? No, a telescope helps me avoid hitting the rocks, dude. <laughs> this saving lives. It's saving the mission. I disagree with you, Pope. This intelligence is awesome, and it's enabling the shipping industry. Yeah. So I think that's that's the way I look at it. And it's gotten to this for me many times. You know, this is one of my favorite things about ChatGPT and Bard and stuff is that my wife, God bless her, my family, even my brothers, my friends, they can't stick with me and I don't stick with them on a topic. They're like, dude, can we change the subject? <laughs> I'm watching something or whatever. They don't stick with me. These guys will stay with me. I love it. And when people go, oh, it's a dumb idea. No, you're not even thinking it through. And chat, no, dude, I did think it through. You got a good idea. Uh, also want to give some uh, guidelines. I was very fortunate. I grew up with a natural general intelligence. My mother was amazingly smart. My father passed when I was a little kid, when I was 10 years old. Um, 
And my mother, uh, we, I grew up very poor in, in North Philadelphia, but she was uh, extremely well read and had a great sense of humor. And I used to say she could sing like better than any Hollywood movie. She, she could rival uh, easy Judy Garland and all those people. And uh, she also had some great ethical guidelines. My first business, I sold a little lemonade stand outside the, her house. And I remember her telling me that, you know, basic rules about covering it. And if you wouldn't drink it, Larry, don't ever sell it to anybody else. That's not nice. The golden rule. How many people in business today are making products that they themselves would never take? Do you think that all the food in the dollar store that's made in there, that the people who make that eat that food? That's wrong. I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, she also had me watch a movie about computers in the 50s. It was called Desk Set with Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And Catherine Hepburn is like my mom, a brilliant woman, <laughs> underestimate. And uh, there's a computer problem. And she just intuitively goes, it's not the computer's fault. Programmed it wrong. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> She also taught me something that I think about a lot when I hear these crazy stories that came out last year about ChatGPT told me to blah, blah, blah. What were you asking it? <laughs> I don't ask my GPS where I should go. <laughs> That's my job. It's a GPS. How would it know what a human would want to see today? I tell it where I want to go. And then it's supposed to make recommendations. And I get to decide, eh, I hear you, but it's not what I want to get. But she also taught me that our history log is not very accurate. She wanted me to always learn from history. We're going to log events and we're going to go over those logs. We're going to work with compliance management to determine what and when to log things and how long we hold on to that. But she pointed out, now you want to learn from history or else you're forced to repeat it. But remember, it's only his, not hers. Because they edited out women. They didn't get a chance. Talk about bias. If you just look at the way women are treated versus men on this planet, and the United States is better than, say, Afghanistan at the moment, we're not getting the full story. And it's very biased. Our entire world, our entire legal system, political systems, I had to look up what religions uh, don't have bias toward women. And the number um, one, I believe, was uh, there were two areas is uh, the Sikhs, the Sikh Indian. There was never any separation of men and women. And the other is Buddhism. Pretty cool. But you can't be the Pope and be a woman. And she also pointed out it's doctored all the time. Blockchain is helping us so a decentralized system will allow us to everybody writes into the log. And with blockchain, it can't be rewritten easily. All right. Now, cyber it actually comes from the word kybernet, a Greek word that means to steer or govern. That's where we get the word govern. And uh, the risk is the rocks under the water that the, 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 the captain could see better with a telescope. The telescope is literally a risk reduction technology, right? We can see better. So um, that's our job. We, we want to see better and, and hopefully uh, reduce risks to our. And a lot of it started, as I mentioned, when, uh, uh, when they the, the mixed tea and, and sugar. So this woman is uh, no, Catherine, Borg, Borgenza, uh, Catherine of uh, Borgenza, Borgenza, something like that. But she married King Charles of England in the 1600s. And the Portuguese had invented this sail. This is the first wide area network technology. This allowed you to sail around the world even without having wind at your back. It took till the, that's why it was actually in the mid 1400s. That's why Columbus was able to sail over to the United States, uh, to India. <laughs> but uh, it was because of this. And so this wide air network technology, if you've ever, if you like Szechuan Chinese food, right, that high pepper stuff, that didn't happen until this sale. Because it was only this sale that allowed us to take peppers from the United States and mix it together. Uh, so we're, we're going to deal with this concept a lot. Now, uh, they started in order to um, uh, back you. This is the birth of the stock market. Instead of one guy putting his money in one mission, and if the ship sunk, he lost his money, 100 people put their money in 100 ships or whatever. And they developed this infrastructure, this Lloyd's Coffee House. It was, um, they're getting tea and coffee, coffee, the men drag. You know, up until ships, 
Europe, Europeans didn't have caffeine. Their only drug was alcohol. No wonder they were always fighting, um, getting drunk and doing crazy stuff. But now they're getting this. So it really launched the Renaissance. You know, and we got all this insurance. And one of the things they did was Lloyd's Registrar. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to do validation. You're going to take your exam. This is to prove that you meet a set of requirements. They perform the exam. But the certification itself is from the ISC square. And then you get accredited, approved for admission. And we're, they wanted you to do that on ships, on the technology, and on the staff. And that's what we still do, only this is for your organization. This is for the common criteria technologies, and this is the staff. And we're going to go through this a lot this week. All right, so we'll go through these standards. You'll feel a lot better than them. Now, 17024 is not on the exam, but tw there are a number of questions on 27001, and there are quite a few things on 15408. Most people seem to miss that. They're still looking at old orange book stuff. I assure you there's no orange book. It's all common criteria today. Yeah, and Lloyd's is still around today. They're doing cyber insurance. They're doing spaceships. They're still around. <clears throat> all right. We're going to go over this a lot too, but at a very big level, the triple constraints mean you want to do something. The captain wants to get T. The T seller wants to sell T. That's the goal. And in order to do that, I need a certain amount of days or else you'll never make it. You got to know how many, time, how many days. I need to bring some level of food for the staff or they'll never make it. In order to encrypt this data, it's got to be at least whatever, 192 bits or else it isn't going to be compliant. If you do 128 bits, that's an unacceptable gap. And you need to close those and you won't pass. You'll never complete your mission. But you might bring a little bit more food. You might go encrypted at 192. I'll go 448 bits. But that's your measure of efficiency. So the more you, you never can have this gap. That's unacceptable. This gap just says you're wasting money. You're wasting time. And we're going to understand that. And we're going to do this in capability maturity. We're looking at CMMI and we're going to measure certain metrics. And the most important metrics are usually how much time will it take and how much is it going to cost? But there's other metrics. Most importantly, when you're taking an exam, read carefully. I know most of the time when I get a question wrong, and I'll do it this week, <laughs> it's because I read something quickly. Someone's going to, Larry, if you look at D, and I go, oh, I didn't even see D. I'm so, for some reason, I thought that said, which is not. <laughs> You're taking a real exam. Read carefully. Right. Now, basically, information can either be true information. I look in this, in, in this drawer, and it says reports, and in there, I see reports. Partial information. The cabinet's locked. I know there's something in there. I don't know what's in there. It's something I know that I know. There's a hidden panel in the back. Did you know that? No, that's no information. There's a covert channel. But you know the worst part? It's misfiled. It's misinformed. We're going to see that all the time. That's how hackers do it all the time. It's not that they said the evil virus and you clicked on it. No, it said your bank and you thought it was your bank. It turned out you were wrong. And attacks on information are a very broad level, either just she's just listening or she's talking. You're you're receiving traffic or you're sending. Now, if you're receiving, and I'm a packet analyst, I have sniffed quite a few things. You could have soundproofed the room. I wouldn't have been able to heard that. Passive attacks are unde undetectable. You can't tell if I'm listening, but you could have prevented it. But an active attack where someone just keeps calling you up on the phone, you can certainly tell. But you can't always prevent it. We'll, bring, we'll look at this all all week and make sure is this active or passive. But the most important thing in governance is where are you going? And I personally think we're going to move into space. I've been a space cadet since I was a kid. I grew up uh, when I was when I was. Uh, this book came out in um, uh, ninety seven or seventy nine. I mean seventy seven, seventy seven, seventy nine. I got a hold of it. And I hear some mute all here. What's going on here? Okay. Um, 
And uh, it was all about space colonies. And basically, uh, uh, Gerald O'Neill uh, was a NASA scientist who felt that our high-tech lifestyle is not really suitable on a planet. And we'd be better suited to move our technologies and manufacturing into space to save the Earth. And one of the, while I was, you know, <laughs> reading this and go, wow, this is cool. He was a professor at uh, at Princeton, and one of the guys in his class, also my age, is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos wants to build these things, so I'm really cool. And if you're going, Larry, are, will these Star Trek graphics, are you allowed to do that? I didn't know, but when OpenAI um, a, a couple months ago uh, gave you the free dolly, <laughs> Sam Altman comes out and says, we promise to protect you. So if I get sued, <laughs> I'm going to him. And when you're picking an answer, make sure that when you uh, pick an answer, you, 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 sometimes people get frustrated, but they're both right. Yeah, sometimes that's true. A and B are wrong, but C and D are both right. Larry drives a Honda CRV. C says Larry drives a Honda. That's accurate. But a Honda CRV is more precise. Now, you could say it's a Honda CRV DX. That's even more precise, but it'd be precisely wrong. I don't drive a DX. So always flush out. Spock can always rule out the inaccurate. Yeah, but this is inaccurate. It's not this. But of the two accurate answers, pick the one that's more precise. All right. Summarizing here, uh, I to mention one of my great uh, heroes. Is, in fact, I think when I talk about like who's the smartest, you know, in, in uh, AI and technology wise, I'll go through a few people. But when it comes to the term wisdom, nobody seems wiser to me than Sadhguru. And uh, he's got a few videos on out on AI, and I love it. I'm so in line with him. He basically says, people are worried. He goes, well, I remember when my father gave me a calculator, and I remember one too. My mom encouraged me. She brought home a calculator from work, and I went nuts on it. And it, But his father didn't want him to use it. He wanted him to learn. He said, why? Why am I wasting my time with this? I have so many other things that I could rather do than sit here trying to do this when I get to set a button. So he feels the same thing about AI. No, that's just good. They're going to free us up to do better things. And alignment starts internally. All right. Let me pause the recording.